OpenEO is the main thing I'm working on. Stack was just the side project, basically, that uh, I started working on because I needed it for OpenEO. Um, so in OpenEO is a uh, funded project by the European Commission at the moment. And the idea behind it is to get an interoperable geoprocessing API for the cloud, for cloud services. Um, so why do we do that? Basically, at the moment, if you want to geoprocess data, um, it's often the case that you have either R, Python, JavaScript, or whatever language you're using. And then you need to connect to any of these cloud services. They have all their own APIs and specifications for how to process data, whether it's, for example, a data cube or tile-based, um, whether it uh, could be like downloaded as GeoTIFF or as whatever. They have all the different things for billing and how to store data and stuff like that. So basically for each of these things, you need a different, uh, a different client. You need to learn how to process the data. You need, like, basically if you start working with one of these services, you're locked in uh, because you have learned that. And of course you want to proceed to work with that because you learned it. And it's always like a tough time to get used to something different. So um, what is, I th what we think is better is to get something like this. You have one client, our Python JavaScript in our case, what we support at the moment. And then you have a streamlined API in between, um, which then translates the things to a single, um, yeah, to a single API basically, where you have a single uh, part how you process, like whether it, for us it's a data cube, uh, how you build things, how you um, download things, um, and so on and so on. So. Um, it's basically like most of you probably know GDAL. That's the thing that translates things between the GIS programs and the data formats. And that's basically some kind of GDAL for the cloud, um, I guess. So um, that helps you to make reproducible uh, research as you can basically um, take your application that you wrote or your algorithm from one provider to the other. So if you run things on the Google Earth engine first, and want to know whether that's really true what they computed for you, then you can take the code that you wrote in R and just change the URL and some other minor things for pre-processing and transform it to code that is running on, for example, Vito, on the Proba V MEP or uh, any of the other um, cloud processing providers that you uh, are aware of. Um, in that case, it's portable to some extent and that's how we think it should be in the future that you just have a very simple access to data in the end and don't need to uh, write proprietary uh, workflows in for other cloud providers. So as I said, it's a language for geospatial processing. Um, we have e on the one side the API, which is basically the translation layer between the clients and the server and a set of predefined processes, which is basically trying to int make interoperable processes so that, um, for example, if you compute things on Python in X array and in R with stars on another package, then processes may slightly differ in regard how they compute things. And we try to do this, like define it on, on a higher level so that you can use all the same processes for processing for all the different kinds of computation software that is in the background. Um, this is in contrast to Stack is focused on processing and Stack was focused on uh, search and discovery. Um, it's open source, so all software we develop here is uh, open source and the specification as well. Um, we are focusing on data cubes, so that's a bit uh, uh, changed maybe from the traditional GIS workflow where you download individual tiles and process based on them. And here it's all basically wrapped into a data cube which you can uh, process on. Um, and we support UDFs, which is a very um, interesting thing because uh, then it allows you to send your R or Python code that is not like the processes we have at the moment are very like uh, narrow in the sense that, for example, that you have, don't can use uh, custom pro um, libraries, for example, that compute some uh, very advanced uh, algorithm that we don't support at the moment. And in that sense, if you need any specific libraries, for example, BFAST for some computations, 
then you can actually run it as UDF, where you can basically just write a script code in Python or R and send it to the server, and then it's executed in the cloud for you. Um, so what is it not? Well, it's not another cloud provider. We just specify the API and the translation layer. It's not another geoprocessing software, so we're not writing the new ArcGIS or something like that. Um, it's really just the translation, and it's not very much as the previous traditional GIS workflow, so that you download the data, then you have tiles, and you need to process them, and so on. It's all cloud-based, so your algorithm is going to the uh, data, which is stored in large amounts in the cloud, and then you get the result back, and not the other way around. Uh, of course, in this part again, I can show this again here, um, which is basically, uh, of course, defining a new standard. And in that sense, we could run into the issue that there are afterwards 15 competing standards, but I hope it's not. <laughs> um, so the API, the translation layer in between, offers the following functionalities. Um, of course, first, it uh, needs to give you the basic information. So it's uh, giving access to discovery things, like, for example, how the API works, what it supports. <coughs> Um, the EO data that you can use in this workflows um, that is exposed via stack, stack collections, uh, and stack API. And then the processes, which is um, basically a, yeah, just a list of processes that, that is supported by the backend. Um, then it supports, of course, authentication uh, with OpenID Connect. Um, then you have workflow management for where you can basically store your uh, own user-defined processes. So if you, for example, um, want to make a new algorithm based on the uh, predefined processes we have, you can store them as user-defined processes again and use them as, were, as, as they were predefined before as it, from the back end. So it's uh, really integrated into things and you can pass around your uh, algorithms and run them uh, on other back ends or you can pass them to other users to be reused. Um, then, then there's file management, where you can basically upload assets if there's a GeoJSON file that you need to pass or something like that, or whether you, there's uh, things that you want to download, all is um, handled via central file management API. Of course, then there is a processing service. You can either process synchronous, so then you basically send the things to the server and immediately, or in a matter of seconds, hopefully, get a response back uh, with a result that, of course, only works for limited like extents and data. Um, and for uh, uh, bigger things, you can use batch jobs, where you can basically uh, also send the data to the server and then wait for whatever time it needs to process the things, and then get back the results uh, to be downloaded again as stack uh, catalog with the appropriate files in it. Um, and a third thing is the web services. So you can basically um, also, there is an API to basically host WMS through OpenEO or WCS or other services that you want to expose. Um, so we don't redefine things for viewing and stuff like that, but rely on the um, standards that are already there and defined pro mostly from o uh, OGC. Um, but you can also like expose non-standardized thing like XYZ tiles that are used by uh, OpenStreetMap, for example. Um, yeah, processes are already mentioned. There is a set of predefined processes, like at the moment, I think 130 or something like that, um, for band mass, for loading data into data cubes, uh, working on data cubes, remaining, renaming dimensions, adding new values and stuff like that. Um, you can visit processes.openio.org to see the list. And um, then, of course, based on the predefined processes, you can uh, define your own user-defined processes which is internally just a graph that is basically a dependency graph with instructions how to work uh, on the data. And then there is UDFs again, which is basically the thing I uh, um, talked about before where you can write your R and uh, Python scripts and send it to the server as part of the other processes. So basically you can say I use a predefined process and then load data with it and then this data gets passed to the UDF. Um, process and then you can further compute it with other processes we have predefined to so save, for example, the data um, and then you're ready to go and download the data. Um, we have several clients implemented at the moment. Um, we're tackling JavaScript, Python and R at the moment, um, which should, should tackle most of the uh, geospatial community, I guess. Maybe there's Julia in the future again, uh, as well, but we'll see. 
Um, we have a browser-based application as well for um, users that are not so much into programming, so that pretty much works like a, a model builder in ArcGIS or QGIS. Um, then we have a Q QGIS implementation where you can uh, use that as a plugin and uh, basically start jobs from uh, QGIS and download it and show it in QGIS directly. And there is a mobile app that can, you can use as well. Uh, this is a screenshot, for example, from the web editor. Uh, you see these uh, workflows over there uh, at the top in the middle. Um, then the management stuff is here in the, in the bottom. You see a list of processes and collections you can use. You can drag and drop them into the model builder. And then on the right, there is a map that uh, you can basically use to uh, view the data. Um, I think there is some NO2 uh, visualization at the moment uh, on the map. Um, uh, this is how, for example, an EVI computation would look like um, on, uh, that is R, yes, that is R. Um, it, it's pretty easy, you just connect to a, uh, the web service with a URL and of course username password then will be prompted. Um, then you basically create a data cube, you can load data, in this example it's Sentinel-2 again. Uh, you can specify the spatial extent, temporal extents and bands to be loaded. Then that will be loaded into a data cube. Um, then, for example, in this case, you will reduce the dimension bands and uh, do some band math on the bands, in this case, the EVI computation, um, and then reduce the temporal dimension to, be, to just give you the minimum composite and save the result as GeoTIFF. And then the same you can do with um, Python in this case. It's looking very similar. Um, you can use the, the functions as if in Python, like uh, the, the um, operators here are overloaded just to be used, um, and then they are translated into our internal representation and sent to the server. Um, yeah, we have several um, server implementations already that are you can reuse um, or extend if you want. Um, there's the GeoPySpark and GeoTrellis implementation. Um, there is a Google Earth implementation, so you can basically run our scripts already on Google Earth Engine as well for free. Uh, there's a GRASS-GIS Actinia implementation. You can go to Marco's talk and at 2 p.m. Uh, to get more about that. Um, there's a JRC Earth Observation Data and Processing Platform from the European Commission. Uh, there's an OpenStack implementation. There is access to Sentinel Hub as well. And there is a server implementation for WCPS, which is in the end Rastaman. Um, there's a bit of ecosystem we also developed. There's, for example, OpenEO Hub, which you can go to, and then you get basically a list of overview which um, servers are there where you can process on. You can basically, for example, also just pass your uh, algorithm that you implemented, and then it tells you in which server you can run it. It gives you information about which data is available, um, what it costs, and stuff like that. Um, you can also share there your um, own defined processes, your UDFs, and stuff like that. Um, and then there is uh, validator, of course, to check whether the API implementations are valid. It checks both the actual, just the structure of the API, whether the responses are valid, and then also it checks whether the results that are processed are valid. Um, so there is a, also a way to check whether in between the uh, back ends there is, are differences that um, are coming from processing. Um, then we have, of course, when you visit processes.openio.org, you see a rendered list of processes, which is basically um, rendered f uh, through um, our doc generator for processes. And of course, you can also reuse, for at least for the uh, data discovery part, you can use the stack and OGC API features ec ecosystem because the API is completely um, yeah, compliant to that um, standard, and, and as such, you can use that ecosystem. And if you expose the WMS, of course, you can just use the WMS uh, clients that you are aware of. Um, the state of OpenEO at the moment is that um, all these partners are working on that, um, and maybe also you in the future. Um, we are currently have released uh, um, version 1.0, release candidate 1, so we are pretty much going into stable mode now after experimenting a long while for two years um, with, with what works best and what doesn't. And um, the project ends um, in uh, the third quarter of the year, so um, then we can expect a stable version where you can really rely on. Um, yeah, and that's it for my two talks. Now I need some water, and then thank you for listening and 
I take your questions. We have some time for questions. Anyone? Can we stack and open your? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so regarding maintaining, um, there are a couple of companies that are basing their work and future work of an open EO, so EODC, for example, and Vito, um, are all already like pushing things internally so that their internal users and external users are using that. So in that sense, they need to f continue with that, of course, um, <laughs> because they have clients that rely on that. Um, and there is also um, further projects that we want to um, establish based on open EO, so... Uh, I hope that will make it future-proof. Um, regarding uh, user um, base, we have some use cases that are running at the moment to really check whether all that what we did is working. Um, that is a broad range of things, um, snow cover analysis, agriculture, and stuff like that. Um, but there could be more, of course. Um, the thing is, like, if you start something new, it's hard to find people that are really want to hop on a thing that is not stable yet, so, but we are <coughs> working on that and it evolves over time. Uh, we also have some meteorological things in the future um, with ECWMF planned, so uh, yeah, that's the future, I <laughs> hope. Um, so for OpenEO, everything is licensed under Apache 2 license. So that's all open source, and you can reuse it uh, to whatever extent you want. Um, so feel free to implement something or do pull requests. It's all on GitHub, um, so that's good. Uh, what was the other thing? About, yeah, actually, I, uh, my, I see that it's, um, everyone built his, this infrastructure on its own, and it's now already somehow patched together. Yeah. Is, this, uh, is there a reproducible infrastructure for that API? Um, is there so, like a Kubernetes or some some script, uh, Helm scripts, or actually some Vagrant script, Terraform. Or something. Um, as far as I know, for most of these um, implementations, there are Docker uh, containers which you can run. Um, that's a start. Um, we're working on making there that more. <coughs> easy to adopt. At the moment, most of the uh, implementers are still like setting up their own infrastructures to get things running, of course. Um, so in the future, there should be more things like Vagrant scripts and stuff like that. Um, yeah. Anybody else? If not, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Matthias? Uh, Jody.